all that we could say about Terry. Uh, the first thing I can say in terms of um, him coming up here, uh, and I just mentioned this, he was a charismatic. I think in the, in the booklet it might mention that, but he was a charismatic Pentecostal for nearly eight years uh, before he came out of that. So uh, don't think that he can't speak to this issue uh, because he's never been in it. He, he can, in that sense, speak from uh, an experiential sense. But he's also uh, a, holds a doctorate, he holds a master's degree. Um, he is a, a, a Bible teacher, he has a teaching ministry. Um, he was the founder and pastor, elder of Harvey Bay Bible Church. Uh, I, I guess if you're going to plant a church anywhere, I, Harvey Bay is a good place to plant a church. Um, and so he planted a church, and now he's, he's moved up to Kansas, is that right? Yeah, so he's, he's no longer the, the pastor elder of Harvey Bay Bible Church, but he was there for a number of years, and, but now he's up in Kansas. His teaching ministry, he's got a writing ministry, as I said, he's got a teaching ministry, so he travels around quite a bit. Uh, because he loves the truth and he wants to give the truth out. I, I should say that uh, I met Terry. I don't know if Terry remembers this. I met Terry about 20-something years ago in Adelaide. Uh, I was teaching at a Bible college, and chapel speakers come through, and one chapel speaker happened to be Terry Arnold. And um, I, I can't, sorry, Terry, can't remember what you exactly said uh, and preached that day, but you did make an impression because we had a, a bunch of lousy chapel speakers coming through, and you, I thought, wow, this guy's pretty good. This, this guy's actually preaching something of substance. But here we are 20-something years later, kind of reuniting, and so it's good to have you here. Um, uh, Diacrisis, Di Diacrisis, Diacrisis, he'll, he'll correct me when he gets up here. That's a newsletter you need to sign up for. Uh, I, I get it, some of you are, are here because you get um, but if you're looking for a, a good publication that keeps you aware of what's going on in evangelicalism, what's going on in the world, uh, what's going on in Terry's life, uh, you need to get that. Sign up for it. It's just a, a, a PDF, so it's an Eden newsletter. You won't get anything through the post. Um, but you need to, to, to sign up for that Dia Christus. So we're just thrilled that Terry's here. Um, and so, Terry, come and teach us all what we need to know about these gifts. Well, good morning, everybody. And it is so good to be here after two years, three years, almost three years of trying and interruptions and finally we get to do it. I'm just thrilled that so many people would come and listen to a topic that not many churches I mean, I've, I've been trying to get churches to put this on, and not many churches will, will actually do it. And maybe it's too controversial for them, I don't know, but I, I think it's an issue that needs to be examined. And the reason why, and I'm going to push this through this seminar, is because I believe it's a gospel issue. In the end, it's going to come down to which gospel are we really talking about. And I think that's important. I think, in, in fact, we need to... You know, we need to teach more on the gospel and we need to pull it apart and learn more. And I found in my later years of pastoring, uh, you know, I used to ask my people, write down for me in half a page what the gospel is. And I got such a disappointment sometimes, such a shock, that they couldn't actually put down what the gospel was or they started adding things to it. And so I think this is uh, really a gospel issue. Uh, the ministry I've got, uh, as Todd uh, talked about, is diakresis. That's the Greek word for discern. Uh, it's, it's a magazine that comes out bi-monthly, um, hard copy or PDF. And that was started in 96 uh, when I came out of the Pentecostal movement. I had got involved in a thing called the Toronto Blessing. Does anyone remember the Toronto Blessing? If you're old, that means you're fairly old. Uh, <laughs> And in 1994-95, I had been a, a Pentecostal by then for about eight years, seven, eight years, and I got involved in that, and what I used to think was demonic, they were now saying was the Holy Spirit. And that really rattled me. And so to cut a long story short, I got totally shipwrecked in the faith. I got very confused, and I decided to... I needed to go back. I needed to read my Bible from Genesis all the way through, which I hadn't done. 
I'd, I'd read a lot of the New Testament and I found it really interesting when I was reading through the Old Testament and I, I would come across things like uh, don't touch the Lord's anointed, which is a common phrase that is used today. And I discovered that that's talking about the kings in, in the Old Testament, King, King Saul. And so I began to realise that I really need to understand what the context of, of what, what I'm reading. Uh, and so th that's, um, that's just some of the history. But look, this morning I want to speak the truth in, in love. If there are times when I, when I get over-passionate, my wife says sometimes I, I, I even sound angry, I, I'm not angry at the people, but I'm angry at false doctrine, false teaching. Because, because I came out of that, uh, I was just adamant that that was, that was going to be my ministry. And I, I felt that the spirit that, that, that was leading me into you know, apologetics is what, what they call it. So we hope to speak the truth in love. But I want to show you as we go through that this is a gospel issue. The gospel, folks, is one thing that has to be accurate. I believe that, that we can never be too accurate in it, that we, we have to make sure that, that we, we have that right. And if you go adding things to it, then it becomes what? Another gospel. Too many pulpits, I think, are silenced on this. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, God has got something to say about that. He calls it accursed. You, you know, to, to do this is to bring a, a, a curse, to add something to the gospel. So we don't need to silence truth. And I think in the political correct uh, age that, that we're living in, it's sometimes... Uh, you know, we're supposed to speak everything that's positive. You know, I find a lot of the Bible is negative, but to me, it, that becomes positive because it's truth. And I think that's what, um, that's what we need to understand. The true gospel changed my heart, and it has continued to do so, as I've clarified and learned it. Uh, and look, some people will say, but look, the people in the charismatic Pentecostal system, they do preach the gospel. Well... If they're adding healing to it, and we'll be talking about the healing of the body, and I want you to stay for the last session because it's one of the, one of the most passionate things that I'm, I'm on about. Uh, whether Do we add, the, did Jesus die on the cross for the healing of our bodies? That's the question that I want to answer in that last session. And it's a very important question because if you say yes, well then some would say that you have added to, to the gospel. And so that's, uh, that's, that becomes an important issue. This is a gospel issue for another reason, that if you change the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, you change the doctrine of Jesus. You know, the, 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 the Puritans and the Reformers, uh, the, the pneumatology, pneuma being the, the, the Greek word for spirit, their pneumatology led to Christ. It pointed to Christ. And so pneumatology must, must point to Christology to the doctrine of, of Christ. And I think today we are increasingly in churches talking a lot about the Holy Spirit but not pointing it back to Christ and not pointing it back to the gospel. These are just some of the issues that I'm kind of introducing because I'm, I'm going to be working through that during the, during the sessions. So you change the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and I believe you change the gospel. So it is a gospel issue. Now, I was going to get into the history, and, and I do want to do that, but I really felt in the last few weeks that I needed to just do a really quick overview of the Holy Spirit. And so now I just want to really quickly give you what would be taught at a very basic level in Bible college, maybe the certificate level, uh, of who the Holy Spirit is and what his work is. And then I want to make a statement at, at the end of that concerning the charismatic Pentecostal system. So who is the Holy Spirit? Well, today I think that we are talking a lot about the, the power and the force of the Spirit instead of the person. And I do believe that the, 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 one of the extremes in the charismatic Pentecostal system is that there is a lot of talk about power. There's a lot of talk about force and not enough talk about the, the person of the Holy Spirit. This goes back in history to what we call the Socinian heresy in uh, the 1600s. They denied the Trinity and they, they talked about the Holy Spirit being a force, being a power. And so that becomes very important. And I think a lot of teaching on the Holy Spirit today is actually very close to that, that heresy of old. 
The Spirit is not just a literal breath or force. He is a person. Uh, Todd just read that through and it came to another comforter. That's an allos parakletos. That's another of the same kind as, as Christ. He is involved in creation. He can be grieved. He can be vexed. Uh, Isaiah 63 verse 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is deity. Uh, you know, the, the, the church fathers were, were, were very um, strong on making sure that the Holy Spirit was taught as, as a person and as deity. Uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 and 10, you've got God speaking and that's then represented in Acts chapter 28 verse 25 as the Holy Spirit speaking which is proof that the Holy Spirit is, is, is God. The Church Fathers, as I said, focus strongly on that. Um, in uh, the New Testament, you've got in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, you remember uh, Ananias and, and Sapphira are, are slain in the Spirit. Uh, you've got one part of that verse saying that the Holy Spirit is speaking, and then in, uh, I think it's verse 5, uh, you've got it's, he's speaking... From it's God that's speaking. And so that's another um, point for the deity. The Holy Spirit is a person in John 16, 13 and 14. And I remember having, a, I used to have this debate with a Christadelphian. Christadelphians don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. And this man would come to my house every two months. He was a debater. He loved to debate. And I'm not into, uh, I don't find it comfortable to uh, debate people, uh, you know, head on, face to face. But I love doing it in, in my newsletter. Uh, so I'm a bit of a coward in, in, in that way. <laughs> but I remember I used to get this guy to read this scripture and I would emphasize one word which really annoyed him, and it's this. John 16, 13, verse 4 and 14. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. How many times do you have to have the word he? before someone sees that this is talking about a, a person. He can be grieved, as I said before, Ephesians 4.30, and he, he has a will, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. Let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm painting a broad brush here. I'm, I'm doing a very, very quick overview. Uh, he, in creation, the Spirit moved across the face of the water, Genesis 1.2. Uh, in the Old Testament, and I think this is very important when we're dealing with um, the charismatic Pentecostal issue, in the, old, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon people. In fact, he came upon people and then off them. And I, wanna, I wanna, want you to really take note of this because this is one of the scriptures that locked me into having to do more study on this to uh, try to understand because my concept of the Holy Spirit and the Pentecostal system was very much out there somewhere. You're wanting the, 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 the Holy Spirit to, to come from outside. Uh, you know, I remember a, an illustration that someone mentioned. In fact, I heard this in a Pentecostal church uh, about a, a Pentecostal conference and there was a man down on the stage introducing it and praying, praying his heart out, saying, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come and be with us, come into this building for your presence, etc. And an old man at the back stood up and said, it's okay, he came with me. <laughs> we, might, we might laugh at that, but you know what, I heard that in a Pentecostal church and I thought, wait a minute, there's something really interesting there. That's the Holy Spirit in us. He's saying when, when he walked through the door, he brought the Holy Spirit with them. Every single person here, when you, if you're a Christian, you walk through that door, you brought the Holy Spirit with you. You brought the anointing with you too. I'll, I'll actually be showing you that later. And, and um, uh, you know, the, I think a lot of Holy Spirit teaching today is teaching it like in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit comes upon people. It's like an outside influence. But the scriptures in the New Testament teach that he is in us. And I think that's where the start needs to be of who this person really is. So um, in the Old Testament, the Spirit left Samson, came upon him, left him. Uh, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, Saul had the Spirit leave him. 
That's what happened in, in the Old Testament. It's very much a temporary uh, thing. But there was a prophecy of a future indwelling. You might know this. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put where? Within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. Now, I believe that that is, is referring to a later event, a future event. And, I, and later on, I'm, I'm going to show you that from Acts 2 onwards, the Holy Spirit comes to earth for the first time and indwells human beings. It's called the promise, the promise of the Father. Today, again, there is a lot of teaching like teaching the Holy Spirit like he is in the Old Testament instead of, of the New. In the New Testament, um, again, the Holy Spirit came upon people, with people, and I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles there, I want you to turn in your Bibles to John 14, 16 and 17, and, I'll, and, if you, and I, here's a school teacher coming out, and me, but if you've got a pen, I want you to mark this because it, it is very important on, when you're teaching on the Holy Spirit, particularly when you're working with charismatic Pentecostal people. John 14, 16, 17. Now this is a, re, a very good scripture for showing the difference between before Acts 2 and after Acts 2. John 14, verse 16 and 17. And it says this, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. The with you is present tense, and the in you is future tense. And this is the delineation between Acts 2, before Acts 2, and after Acts 2. Comes. From Acts 2 onwards, the Holy Spirit is an indwelling, permanently abiding Holy Spirit. Before that, it says there, he is with you. And uh, on Sunday night here, when I come Sunday night, I'm gonna be, uh, I've got a sermon called Peter's Makeover. Um, I, I, one night I was watching the TV and they had this show called Makeover, you know, and they bring people in and they dress them up and um, do all sorts of stuff with them and, 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 uh, and they come out and the husband goes, wow, what happened to her? You know, she, she really changed. I don't know what happens when, when the makeup wears off and, 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 and they wake up beside them next morning and, it, and it's all different. But I, des I decided to, you know, to look at the... At the, the um, the whole, uh, Peter before Acts 2 and after Acts 2 and I found some really interesting things. Peter before Acts 2 is very, very different to Peter after Acts 2. And, and so there is, a, there is a, a, a definitely a, a, a different operation of the Spirit from Acts 2 onwards. More on the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals truth in nature. Uh, we um, call that general Revelation and in the Bible, in the 66 books of the Bible, um, specific revelation. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correct, correction and training in righteousness. And 2 Peter 1, 20, verse 21, a very important one. Uh, we have the more sure word of prophecy. But what is that? This is the question that we need to ask people today. What is that? In fact, we need to ask people today, what is scripture? Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there that believe scripture is not just in the 66 books of the Bible. It's also oral revelation coming from what the Holy Spirit is supposedly telling them. And this is where the very much of the confusion comes in. 2 Peter 1, 20, verse 21, the more sure word of prophecy. In verse 20, it says it's the prophecy of what? The scripture. Hebrews 1, verse uh, 1 and 2. God, who at various times in various manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. I wish prophets today, uh, who, people who call themselves prophets, would read that and look at that. It's talking about something in the past there. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. To me, Jesus Christ is the, is the last prophet. Uh, and... 
and um, you know, I'm a, I'm a sticker for the, 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 the Bible being closed. It's sufficient. It's all sufficient. We don't need any more than that. But that's not the case. I'm debating a person online at the moment in America who calls himself a prophet, an apostle, and also a teacher. And I asked him the question, I said, look, if you've got all these extra revelations from the Holy Spirit about a, a revival coming to Canada, etc., um, and I said, if these are really words from God, why don't you add some pages in your Bible? I, I mean, I'm playing the, you know, the advocate here. Uh, why don't you add some pages in your Bible and write down all these? Now, most times I have people stop and think, but this guy actually quite surprised me. He said, well, actually I have. He said, I've got a book. I've got a whole book, and it's, it's thicker than my Bible of what the Holy Spirit has said to me. And folks, this is where extra biblical revelation will, will go. They will go that far uh, that they will say that they are hearing from the Holy Spirit and they will be adding it to the Word of God. To me, this is separating the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. And that's part, of, I think, is, of, of the problem with the, uh, the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic movement. The question is, that is the Spirit speaking outside of the canon of Scripture? Well, we'll get to that a little bit further on. The Holy Spirit fills us. That is different to the baptism of the Spirit. The next session we will look at the core teaching of the Pentecostal movement is the baptism of the Spirit as a subsequent, as a secondary experience. Um, and, and folks, um, stay for that session, please, because that is, if, if you can get that sorted out, you've got the core of, you, you, you really understand what the Pentecostals teach because that is at, at, the, at the core of their teaching. Um, the filling of the Spirit, um, Ephesians 5, 18 to 20, be not drunk with wine or as an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Greek word is pleru, it means a control. Now, as a Christian, we should be filled with the Spirit, and that is a control from within, from the, Holy, from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Um, and so we do need to separate what the baptism of the Spirit is from the filling. We'll do that in, in, in the next session. The Holy Spirit seals, Ephesians 1, 13 and, and, and 14. Uh, there are people today now in the charismatic system that are teaching a, a sealing after salvation. But that's not what Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 teaches. In whom you also trusted when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom when you, you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit teaches truth, John 16, 13. He will guide, guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit leads and guides, Romans 8, uh, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit gives assurance, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. This is, imp this is an important one, John 16, 13, 14. He shall not speak of himself, he shall glorify me. He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Again, pneumatology, this um, teaching of the Holy Spirit, needs to be pointing to Christ. It needs to be Christocentric. Today, I think you've got a lot of spirit-centered theology. And it's not pointing to Christ. And I'm telling you, it's not pointing to the gospel. And as I said before, Puritan theology, and I'm a, look, I'm a bit of a Puritan fan, I have to admit. I've gone back and, and had a look at this. They have great teachers on pneumatology, on the study of the Holy Spirit. If you want to get into that, uh, there's um, two people's names, and I've got them a little bit further on somewhere. I can't think who they are now. But the Father electing, the Father e elects, the Son purchases, and the Spirit applies is what the Puritans taught. In other words, they made it all of the, of the Trinity. When they talked about the Holy Spirit, they involved the Trinity and they involved Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. John 16, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. And he brings the message of the gospel to the hearts of those who will believe. The Holy Spirit intercedes. Romans 8, 26. Um, by the way, this verse is used for tongues. This is interesting. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I had a married couple come to me once, and the, the husband uh, was a Reformed Christian, 
and the wife was a, the wife to be was a Pentecostal, and they were at loggerheads, and I, I was not not happy to marry them. I didn't want to marry them until this this thing was sorted out, and we got into a discussion with the with the lady, and she quoted this scripture and said, "This is what the Holy Spirit showed me, is tongues is for tongues." And, and, and that, this is one of my favourite scriptures. And so I put it back to her and said, well, let's read it again. It says there, for us groanings which cannot be uttered. You can look at the Greek in that and it's talking about spoken, uh, put forth out of the mouth, uttered. And I said, so how can it be tongues? It's not uttered. It's something that's in. It, it's a groaning within. When, when you don't know what to pray, it, it, you... You're wanting the Holy Spirit to take over. And she then said, well, then I haven't heard from the Holy Spirit then. And I said, well, uh, who have you heard from? Or what have you heard from? It's either the flesh or it's the devil. And that put a stop to a lot of her extra biblical teaching. And she started to go back and study. And this is uh, uh, what I'm always trying to get people to do. In fact, the Puritans use that scripture very much. They link the Holy Spirit there with prayer and, with, and this verse with informal uh, uh, prayer. He's the spirit of prayer and supplication. The Holy Spirit anoints us, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. This is very important when, when you're talking about charismatic Pentecostal issues. Uh, 1 John 2, 27. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abides, remains in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. First of all, you'll see that the context is false teachers. It, it has there, you don't need any man to teach you. So this is the context, it's about false teachers. But note in verse 27 where it says, you have received the anointing of him. That's God. You received it from God. You don't receive it with ma from man. It's not passed on from any, any other man. It's from God. And then it says, that anointing, which is the Holy Spirit, because this is what's, what's called a metonymy, a metonymy, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. So the anointing, the word anointing here is literally the Holy Spirit. And so it says there, it, you receive it of him and it abides in you. This is a permanent, th this is something permanent. It remains in you. And you need not that any man teach you, again, that's referring to the false teachers, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth, is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. This is, refer this is about the anointing. And you will note here that this is not some anointing that, that's caught from outside. It's, the anoint it's speaking about the Holy Spirit that is in you. And I might add this. No one here has any more anointing than me. And I don't have any more anointing than you. We all have the same anointing. It's the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. That, that verse, that scripture there is really important to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. I might also add that the Holy Spirit is in us. I probably differ from uh, even some, some Reformed people. They often talk about the Holy Spirit from almost in an outside sense. But I do think that we need to be careful about this and come back to the Holy Spirit being in us. The Holy Spirit finally sanctifies, makes us holy. Now this is very important because in, in, this, in, in this session I'm going to get to the historical problem with the, the Pentecostal charismatic system is that they change the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification is progressive. It's positional at salvation but progressive. Throughout your life you, will, you are being Conform to the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit in you. That is sanctification. It's, it's really another word, word for holiness. Uh, and, and so 1 Thessalonians 4, um, 3, it talks about possessing your vessel and sanctification. Um, it's the will of God for you to be sanctified. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 uh, talks about uh, work out your salvation. And then it says, uh, it talks about... Um, uh, for it is God which works in you. That's sanctification. 
Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's quite amazing the number of times the word in comes up for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit conforms us to the image of Christ. Romans 8, 29 has a definition for sanctification. Um, it mentions justification, it mentions glorification, but it also has sanctification in it when it says this, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. That is sanctification. Now, that's a simple overview, all right? I've gone and added this in. Um, bear with me, this session is a little bit long. I haven't even got to the history yet, but uh, I wanted to do that because this is a statement I wanted to make. I wanted to say that far too much of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the teaching of the Holy Spirit, has gone beyond that. I have gone beyond that. That is basically the teaching of the Holy Spirit. You would learn that in a, in, in a college at certificate level. Uh, and, and in church, you would, you, if, you do, if you're working through the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, they would be the major points. It's the faith once delivered. It comes from the church fathers. It's in the reformers. It's in the Puritans. And those two men that I mentioned with the Puritans are Owen and, and, and um, Sibs. The problem with much of the teaching today is the Holy Spirit has become rather not those things but a power or a force instead of more about the person and his work. That's an important point there. And you have now the Holy Spirit, I believe, glorifying men. That worries me. It really worries me. He, it must be Christ-centred. He must glorify Christ. So the foundation is Christ and, he, and his gospel. If we mislay that and we start adding new teachings on the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you where you're going to end up. And I can show you this over and over again. You're going to end up in mysticism. You're going to end up in mysticism. You're going to end up in extra-biblical theology. You're going to end up with, worse than that, another spirit. Well... Um, as I said, uh, in the T Toronto Blessing, when that hit in 94, I got shipwrecked, completely shipwrecked. Uh, what I w was always thinking was of the devil was suddenly now supposed to be the Holy Spirit. And so that caused me to go back and to study those things that, that I have just, just mentioned. The seedbed for the Pentecostal movement, this is really important, is the holiness movement in the 1800s. History is a fantastic teacher, I'm telling you. That's why I've started with history. I wanted to get that out first before I got in, into the doctrines. Um, the holiness movement in the late 1800s, I believe, is a seedbed for the Pentecostal movement. The history is quite amazing. Um, now, I know you can go back to the Montanas, the, you know, they can say it's got roots in the Montanas, the heretical Montanas movement of, of the third century. Um, you can go back to the Quakers in the 1600s. They believed in, in an inner light and that the, the spirit used their conscience and eventually they separated that from the word of God and began to listen more to that than, than the word of God. But the Methodist movement in the late 1800s developed stages and states of sanctification. This was where the problem started. I love digging in and finding out where, where did this start. You know, any organisation, cult groups, if you're studying the cult, you've got to go back and find out where did this start? What year? What person? What did they believe? And you'll find that you get to the Methodist movement in the late 1800s and they were developing states and stages of sanctification instead of a continuous uh, operation of the Holy Spirit as being progressive sanctification. Now I've got up on the PowerPoint here the Westminster Confession and this was, you know, this is in the, you know, the 1600s and this is what was believed and this is where the Methodist Church departed from this. The confessions of faith at that time taught a continuous progressive sanctification that there was a war between the spirit and the flesh and I want you now to look at, at the PowerPoint at the Westminster Confession. The, it, it, it says, quote, the dominion of sin is broken through the present, though the presence of sin is not entirely eliminated. Just as penicillin may break a fever, just destroying the dominion of a disease, and yet some time elapses before every trace of the disease is eliminated, so it is with sin. And 
Now you'll see here that it's talking about the dominion of sin being broken, the lordship of sin being broken, but not entirely the presence of, of sin. The Baptist Confession now, in 1689, it says this, quote, They who are united to Christ, having a new heart, a new spirit created in them, it goes on to say, are also further sanctified by his word and the spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed and several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. And they, that's the believers, more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of all true holiness. This sanctification is throughout the whole man, yet imperfect in this life, there abideth still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence arises a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, from the sanctifying spirit of Christ and the, the regenerate part that overcome, and so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness, press, pressing after the heavenly life. And you'll see there the progressive aspect of sin. You'll see the war and there are no shortcuts. Now what happened with the Methodist movement, they, they began to develop shortcuts. They, de they began to develop, well, actually, they, they actually got into entire sanctification, that you can get to a state where you're entirely sanctified. But 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting is a Greek present active. It's progressive action. At salvation, folks, the lordship was broken of sin. The dominion was broken. That was destroyed. But sin was not destroyed. There are remnants of it there, and it's in the flesh. The Greek tenses in, in sanctification passage show that it's positional and then progressive. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, there was a gradual slide away from the historic, orthodox, biblical teaching, which, is, which you've, you've seen up there in just two confessions, um, as a process. With that came a change in the direction of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. It was a shift away from the primacy of the gospel too. In your um, booklets there, you have an appendix, justification, sanctification, glorification. I haven't got time to go into that, but I do believe that people need to really study these three words. They're in our Bibles. We need to know what justification is. We need to know what sanctification is. Justification is the imputed righteousness that is given to you. It's not yours. It's credited, given to you. Romans 4 talks about that. Sanctification, as I said, is the progressive working out of your salvation that to be, and conforming you to the image of, of Christ. Here's the timeline of um, some of the players. First of all, is Phoebe Palmer died in 1874, and Charles Finney. Charles Finney is actually, a, surprisingly, a key player in this, 1875. And they developed further states of sanctification. In fact, at one stage, at a college he was teaching at, at Oberlin, it was called Oberlin Perfectionism. Listen to what, listen to what Charles Finney said. As an Entire sanctification exists in perfect obedience to the law of God and as the law requires nothing more than the right use of whatever strength we have, a state of entire sanctification is attainable in this life on the ground of natural ability. Now, I, I can't, I can't um, uh, strongly say how much heresy there is in that, honestly. There's a lot of, there's a lot of issues, a lot of problems in that. Perfect obedience to the law of God? There's only one person that has perfect obedience to the law of God. It's Jesus Christ. Man is not going to get that. Uh, and the law requires nothing more than the right use of whatever strength we have? I mean, that's works. And, and, and our strength, natural ability, he says... Uh, I mean, th th this takes away from, from the work of, of the Holy Spirit and it takes away from working out your salvation. Entire sanctification, I believe, is a heresy. Now, that's what was taught and a lot of things came from that. Then in 1850s, you had what's called the higher life movement. 
Uh, they taught a series of states of experiences to, to do with sanctification. You had the Keswick movement in 1870s. At this stage, I will say that there was an emphasis on holiness. I can't dispute that. There was an emphasis on holiness. They didn't generally stress a second work of grace. Not, not yet, but it's coming. At the end of the 1800s, the holiness enthousi enthusiasts began to use a phrase called the baptism with the spirit. It was used at the end of the 18th century. You know, th this, this teaching of the baptism of the spirit as a second work of grace is very new. I mean, you, you are looking at probably 130, 140 year, year, years old. And so in, a time, in time, the sanctification experience or stages became amalgamated with this phrase, the baptism with the spirit. Benjamin Irwin in the 1890s developed a fire baptism. It, it kept going into other baptisms. Then he developed a baptism of dynamite, a baptism of lyddite, and a baptism of oxidite. And then, and here's what happens a lot when you look at these players. He fell into, guess, immorality in, in his own church. There is definitely a link. You get off into wrong doctrine in sanctification and it seems to end up in, with a lot of these players in immorality. Benjamin Irwin in the 1890s, uh, he had this fire baptism, but it was leaving the progressive sanctification. And there, look, there was progressive, what I call leaven coming in here. Now, I want to say this. There was a genuine desire by these people. There's no doubt there was a genuine desire that they wanted to deal with their sin. But they shortcut what the scriptures teach. And they developed crisis points. I got this up, up on a PowerPoint. This is the stages. So the stages here are the progressive leaven, as I call it. First of all, there is a genuine desire. And then they, this led to them developing what was called crisis points of sanctification. And then stages, and then an, even an entire sanctification. And then, towards the end of the 19th century, you had a, what is called a subsequent baptism with the Spirit that was attached to that. And then tongues, even tongues then after in the 20th century, tongues is the evidence of this experience. 1901, and here's where, here's where the Pentecostal system really, really starts. 1901, a man called Charles Parham. They credit, most Pentecostals credit Charles Parham as the founder of the modern Pentecostal movement. He died in 1929 at Topeka in Kansas in 1901. He had a Bible college, of, he had 34 students and he, he wanted them to, to repeat the experience of Acts 2. He wanted them to repeat it. They stayed up all night and after midnight, a lady called Agnes Osmond stood up and began to speak in what they thought was tongues. Now, Parham, Charles Parham believed in xenoglossalia. Xenophoron, xeno glossalia is to, to speak in languages, to speak in tongues. He believed in real languages. This is the founder of the Pentecostal movement. And yet, Agnes Osmond stood up and he thought it was Chinese. He brought in a linguist. And the linguist, and linguists, it, it, it doesn't take them long. They can tell you what, what, what uh, family, it is, and then they work their way down even, even to dialects. And he said, this is not a language known on earth. This is ecstatic. It's ecstatic tongues. She got ecstatic tongues, and it caught on to some other people. There were some people in the group that left. They were angry at what happened, uh, and, and, it, and it actually split the, the group. But folks, the history of unknown tongues movement begins with that. Agnes Osmond is a key player in, in this. And you can read about her, how she f uh, followed um, the holiness groups around, around the country um, and was into it, it extremes. But that's the history of where we got the tongues and then they developed that with the baptism of the Spirit, uh, the tongues as evidence of the baptism of the Spirit. Later on, another man um, left that group and began what's called Azusa Street. Now, a lot of Pentecostals trace their roots to Azusa Street in 1906. I trace it to Topeka. You can go back to Topeka in 1901 and you'll find the first case of the modern tongues in, in, in there. In 1906, a William Seymour 
left uh, Topeka and went and started a church in Azusa Street. Before that, he went to a Nazarene church and he was kicked out for heresy and he, so he started his own church in Azusa Street, Los Angeles in 1906. Uh, and as he got, got into that uh, church over a year or two, he began to be very concerned about whether the tongues was real or whether it was ecstatic. There was arguments about that. And also the, uh, the manifestations that were occurring. And he called in Charles Parham to help him. Charles Par Parham was actually his mentor. And um, I will uh, tell you what Charles Parham said. He said this. He found hypnotic influence, familiar spirits influence, spiritualistic influence, mesmeric influences, and all kinds of spells and spasms, falling in trances, etc. All of these things are foreign to and unknown to his apostolic faith movement outside of Los Angeles, except in the places visited by the workers sent out from, from this city. The original, he's, he originally called the Pentecostal movement the apostolic faith mission. And then it, in, it developed in, into the, what, what's called the Pentecostal churches. And so that's the history there. Parham later denounced Azusa Street. When I talk to Pentecostal pastors today, they don't know this history. They actually uh, celebrate Azusa Street. And it doesn't take much to look at the history. I've got a book down there called Fields White Under Harvest. And it's a historic book that it goes through the history of this, uh, how it started and where it went to Azusa Street and how Azusa Street was finally closed in 1911. There were eyewitnesses at Azusa Street. In fact, I'm going to give you one now that was in favour of what was happening at, at Azusa Street. He said that there were jerks and treeing the devil. In other words, they were crawling up, up uh, and barking up like what they thought was a tree like a dog. That same thing, by the way, happened in the Toronto Blessing. I remember seeing it in 1994. And they were in evidence at Azusa Street. Azusa Street was closed in 1911, and a lot of it was because of the shameful immorality that was occurring there. Um, and, and the papers, the, the papers picked up on this. Uh, um, you know, there's not much good in the papers written about Azusa Street in those days. Now, from Azusa Street, you have all your Pentecostal churches worldwide. All roads go back to Azusa Street. India was the first. You had missionaries going from Azusa Street out to these countries. Stories were told of how pastors preached sermons in tongues and people heard them in other languages. Uh, in November 1906, Minnie Abrams um, took the, uh, the Azusa Street um, services and the, the manifestations, etc., and the tongues over uh, to India. Parham believed biblical tongues were known earthly languages. He, he rejected Azusa Street. The Azusa Street missionaries then went out worldwide and they were expecting miraculous languages. They were still thinking xenoglossalia. Well, here's what happened. In 1909, a missionary, C, uh, S.C. Todd, of the Bible Missionary Society, has made investigations personally in three mission fields. People who have gone from this country to Japan, China, India, expecting to preach to the natives of those countries in their own tongue, but in no single instance have been able to do so. They have needed an interpreter. Some of them are in des absolute destitution and are dependent on their Christian brethren for the necessities of life. In some cases, they are in danger of losing their faith. That's, that's the tragedy of the missionaries that went out from Azusa Street. You had Italy, Brazil, Norway, and Persia came next. Uh, William Durham uh, from Chicago, uh, he'd been to Azusa Street, went to Ch Chicago. He sent missionaries out to those countries. In 1907, he explained how he got the Holy Spirit. He worked on my whole body, one section at a time. First my arms, my limbs, my body, my head, my face, my chin, and finally at 1 a.m. Saturday, March the 2nd, after being under the power for three hours, he finished the work on my vocal organs and spoke through me in unknown tongues. The testimony, folks, of some of these is just astonishing, really. And this is the, this, these are the major players in this. He took the experience to, to Italy, uh, it spread worldwide. Norwegian friends um, took it to their country and, per and Persian uh, men took it to their country. 
1909, William Durham met the next player, Amy Sample McPherson. Uh, she died in 1944. Uh, um, Durham would recite lengthy tongues messages and Amy would interpret them. Many were published in Pentecostal papers. Uh, one, of them, one of them was this. I, the spirit of liberty and of truth, will speak if you will let me have my way. Now, if you know your doctrine, there's a lot of issues with that. I mean, that is taking away from what I believe is the sovereignty of God. He hasn't got his hands tied as in, as in that. But that's the way that they viewed the Holy Spirit. In the same year, 1909, Durham's wife died after childbirth. In 1910, his six-month-old daughter died of pneumonia. He married again in 1912 and later that year died at age 39, leaving behind a pregnant 29-year-old wife and two young children from his first marriage. Um, you know, there are some devastating things that happened to some of these leaders. In 1912, the Assembly of God started in the USA. That's, that's a key date. The, all of it comes back to Azusa Street. All roads lead to Azusa Street, I say. Latin America uh, was a man called Elizabeth. The Mexicans went out from Azusa Street uh, and they developed what's called the Oneness Movement. Who's heard of the Oneness Movement? Is um, a Pentecostal group that does not believe in the Trinity uh, and they believe that God manifests himself completely in Jesus Christ. That, the roots of that is actually from Azusa Street, again. He claimed to have mass healings of hundreds and even thousands of people all at one time. When you search for the documentation, it is not there, and I'll get to that in, in a healing section. The characteristics, folks, of exaggeration, I have to say, amongst the Pentecostal, these Pentecostal leaders is uniform. Smith Wigglesworth is the next one. Uh, when you talk to charismatic Pentecostals, a lot of them are very, very uh, much widely read on Smith Wigglesworth. He prophesied a mighty restoration of the sign gifts of the Spirit and a revival before the end of the 20th century. Amazing stories of miracles and healings. Um, he would punch um, cancer uh, um, uh, tumour victims until they died and then supposedly bring them back, back from the dead. And I think there's a Todd Bentley, is it Todd Bentley today, that has tried to copy that uh, and got himself in a lot of trouble. Summel, uh, Lester Summel, you may have heard of him. The man that brings the stories of Smith Wigglesworth is actually Lester Summerall. He was in charge of Feed the Hungry uh, organisation. I think that's still there today. It, most of the stories come from Lester Summerall. When I started to try to track this down and get documentation, it came to Lester Summerall. And there's stories handed down from story after story after story, like, um, what is it, Ch um, Chinese whispers. Some will falsely prophesy that he would see the return of Jesus before the end of 1999 and that Jesus appeared to him and spoke this to him personally. The impact, folks, finally, of women in this Pentecostal system is very interesting. Um, you've got Alma White, Ida Robinson, Marie Woodworth, Edda, were early women pastors. A lot of the people, a lot of the missionaries were women that went out from Azusa Street. Uh, Florence Crawford claimed to be the first white woman to receive the Holy Spirit baptism at Azusa Street in 1906. She founded the Apostolic Faith Mission in Portland and was very instrumental in, in having people go out to other countries. Amy Semple McPherson died in 1944, faked her own kidnapping to have an adulterous affair. She had three husbands. The third left his wife and children to marry her. That marriage was short. She had a nervous breakdown. Her husband filed for divorce. 1944, she died of an overdose of sleeping pills, and she passed the mantle on to the next player, who was Catherine Kuhlman. Catherine Kuhlman died in 1976, married a man who divorced his wife to marry her. Kuhlman then divorced him. She had a meeting with the Pope and, and, and felt a oneness with him. Benny Hinn claims to have received his anointing from Catherine Kuhlman. Many church leaders, folks, at that time were attacking the movement. Uh, Harry Ironside, in 1940, was a, was a key Bible teacher. This is what he said. We could scarcely believe such scenes were possible outside a lunatic asylum. He actually visited one of these places. 
and even there the keepers would not permit such goings on. He described it as disgusting delusions, pandemonium exhibitions worthy of a madhouse or a collection of holy dervishes. Uh, a heavy toll, of, there's been a heavy toll of lunacy. Campbell Morgan at that time described Azusa Street as, quote, the last great vomit of Satan. These men did not hold back. These were Bible teachers. These, these were the leaders, the, the, the pastors, the leading pastors of, of the biggest churches of, of the day. Tory declared this new Pentecostal movement was emphatically not of God and founded by a sodomite. The reason why he said that was because Charles Parham was later charged with sodomy, uh, but not, not convicted. He, uh, in, in fact, Charles Byham taught a seven-day, cre uh, a, a, a taught that he rejected the seven-day creation. He said that Adam and Eve were not a part of the creation, and that others existed outside the garden. I mean, some of his teachings are, are really bizarre, but he claimed to have received all of them from revelations from God. In conclusion, look, we would do well to learn from history. Roots determine fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. The faith once delivered, folks, is, is attested to in the, in the historic faith. You can go back and see what's orthodox. You can read the confessions. New theology on the Holy Spirit came in at the 20th century. There were prophecies of revival. I've lost the count of the number of times when I was in a Pentecostal church as a leader in it when we, we were hearing about the... the, the there's a, there's a world revival coming, and it's coming soon, it's soon, it's soon. And then you've got the signs and wonders movement. Folks, I challenge people, look at wherever you see signs and wonders in the end times in the Bible. You will always find them what? Lying or false. You're never going to find them true. And that's why we should be cautious even of the signs and wonders movement. Tongues had a beginning, folks. I can't wait to get to the tongue section because it, it's, I, I want to give you some practical ways that you can... Uh, questions. I have a series of questions. I, I don't believe in debating. I have a series of questions that I give people and when they can't answer it, I say, you really need to, to study that. I can give you some scriptures for this so you can study and you'll find the answer in, in those scriptures. It had a beginning, 1901, even with Agnes Osman. The Azusa Street mission, folks, is the key. Or Topeka and then Azusa. Your Pentecostal affiliations all come from, from that. As I said, AOG started in 1912, uh, 1912 in America. The lessons from this are this. The leaven of extra-biblical doctrine is subtly and progressively introduced. You can't separate the Holy Spirit from the Word. They must be joined. And I think this has been the problem. And it, because experience, often a, a lot of these experiences will do that. They'll separate the Holy Spirit from the Word. The seeking of more must not be done from the outsides of the confines of orthodoxy. And that's not a bad word. It's, it, you know, it's become a bad word today, but it shouldn't be. It's the confessions of the faith that, that we've had. It's the faith once delivered, Jude 3. Truth has boundaries. Error has none. You let leaven in, and what happens? The scripture tells us it will, it, it'll spread to excesses. The Christian has received all spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1 verse 3. To seek more than promised in scripture from the already indwelling Holy Spirit, folks, I believe is to grieve, to grieve the Holy Spirit. The effect of the gospel, folks, on this has been devastating. The gospel has all, all but been lost in a quagmire of new doctrines, new healing doctrines, new spirit baptisms, etc. Folks, I, I'm going to say this. The gospel is not about the Holy Spirit. The gospel is about Jesus Christ crucified. Yes, the Holy Spirit brings a message to the hearts of the people, but it must be Christ-centered about him on the cross. New gospels. We'll get to the healing and um, the prosperity thing that they teach too also. And you've got two appendixes. I'm, I'm going to close now. The appendix is in your booklet. Appendix 2 is Azusa Street, What Really Happened? Page 17. 
That'll give you, you know, you can read that and go into it a lot deeper. And Appendix 3, Smith, Wigglesworth, I tell you, folks, that's fascinating reading, really, as to, as to where we got all these stories from. Page 29. The next session, uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing the baptism with the Spirit, and, that, and that's a short session. It's the, it is the crux, it's the core of the Pentecostal movement. Thank you for listening, and I believe now we're going to have a morning tea break. Let's, let's just pray, just, just close. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you. Lord, there's a lot of information here. And Lord, I just pray that we might um, uh, at least um, see the overview of it and uh, maybe read the booklet and see this. And Lord, uh, history is important because you've got this in your scripture that uh, roots determine fruit. And so we need to sometimes go back and look at the roots of some of these things. Lord, as we continue now in fellowship, help us to have sweet fellowship. Um, and Lord, as we come to the next session, we pray that you would just be preparing our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.